Uh, so hi everyone, thanks for coming out against the, uh, the wind and the rain and the coronavirus and apathy. <laughs> um, and we're going to talk about green, greener web development. Um, when, you, when you talk about green things, um, there's a lot of different subjects packed into that. What I'm going to focus on today is climate change and uh, how the work we do affects that directly. Um, <clears throat> this is, I'm Kieran. Um, I spend most of my time for the last few years doing training, coaching, consulting uh, across a load of subjects, agile, BDD, architecture, OO, design, system design. Uh, and I'm a PHP developer since last millennium. Uh, and I'm a parent and um, it's one of the reasons I'm doing this talk. You don't have to be a parent to care about the future. <laughs> But um, when you are a parent, you think about the future a lot. You sort of think, oh, what's it going to be like when you grow up? Uh, and uh, things get a bit scary. I didn't put a picture of my daughter in the talk. That's me. But I look a bit like her in that picture. <laughs> so I'm going to talk a bit about where we are with climate change, uh, what the plan is, and hopefully convince you that there are concrete actions you can take that are going to help the situation. That's really what I want to get from this talk. It's not a new situation. This is um, a letter in a newspaper in 1912 saying, hey, you know all this coal we keep burning? Maybe the planet's going to warm up as a result. That's uh, 108 years ago. Someone in New Zealand spotted that. Um, and at the time, they make the point there, adding seven uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere every year. Nowadays, it's more like 40 gigatons. Um, and we think of 1912 as when all the smoke was belching out the chimneys. Uh, it still is, it's just not as dark, so we don't see it. This is the depressing bit of the talk. Um, we are going to get to what we're going to do about it, but it's important to talk about it. Yes? However, the last line says the effect may be considerable in a few centuries. A few centuries, yeah. So just one, really. Well, yeah, let's look at it over one century. Um, they wrote the letter about here. And this, uh, the red and blue lines are two separate measurements of uh, global temperature. You can see they pretty much agree with each other, so they're probably right. And the, the sort of um, green, I'm going to say, line is, is climate modelling. So you can see that roughly agrees with the measured effects, so which gives us some confidence that the models are going to be uh, accurate in the future. And you can sort of see that um, since the 1940s, we've gained about one degree Celsius globally, uh, which doesn't sound like an awful lot. If you go from one room to another, <clears throat> and one's one degree warmer, that doesn't really have a big impact on you. Um, but the last ice age, when Europe was basically covered with sheet ice, was four or five degrees uh, lower than what we have now. So these individual degrees do make a massive impact in literally what the planet looks like. It's quite heavy. Um, 2015 in Paris was the um, 21st meeting of the COP, the climate change conference, and it was the first one in 20 years that came to a binding agreement that everyone signed at the end. There had been previous agreements that have been archived, let's say. Um, and COP26 is in Glasgow this November, so we're hosting the, the, this year's one. Um, but the aim at the end of that was to limit the temperature rise to one and a half degrees centigrade. We're currently nearly at one degree. It's to limit it to one and a half degrees. There's no conversations about stopping it or reversing it. And even this one and a half degrees is seen as quite an ambitious target. Some of the nations at the conference wanted to make it two degrees, uh, but other nations pointed out, at two degrees, our country won't be there anymore. So can we make it one and a half degrees, please? Mostly island nations. Uh, so that was 2015. How are we getting on? The black line is carbon emissions per year over time. You'll notice it briefly goes down, but that's just a statistical anomaly, I would say. Um, and this sort of mid-grey line 
is where our emissions have to be to hit that target of one and a half degrees. Um, depending when we start reducing emissions, uh, the way it kind of works is to, to get that one and a half degrees target, there's a budget of how much carbon we can release from now till the end of time. So more or less the area under the curve has to be the same. So the yellow lines are showing you if we had started earlier, things would have been easier. And the purple lines are showing you if we wait, it's going to be incredibly drastic. So the point where if we wait until 2030, the emissions in 2031 would have to drop to zero to hit that one and a half degree target. Um, so we need to start. It needs to start reducing now by about 6% this year and then continue reducing by the same amount every year until we get to this nice tail off. And we'll know by about 2030 whether we've done it. So this decade is really crucial. We could have started in 1980, by the way. I was, um, I was like 12 years old in 1990 and I knew about global warming. I'd read about it in the newspaper. I'd read about it in New Scientist. People knew it was happening. <clears throat> the IPCC is an international group um, set up by um, the UN and the World Meteorological Associate Organization as a forum for sharing basically scientific consensus. 195 countries are members of this. And in 2018, they released this report, it's the special report SR15, which is the special report about one and a half degree Celsius. And it basically tells you what a one and a half degree hotter planet is like. <clears throat> they split it into these four categories. There's a lot of qualitative text analysis in there. It's a really long document. You can read it for free. Um, and in each category, they, um, they basically explain the risk with this color code against the temperature rise. So we're currently here. So a lot of these measures are yellow, which is moderate risk. And if we manage to hit our target of one and a half degrees, some of the things are still red, which indicates high risk. Um, another part of the summary drills into some areas. So at the moment, corals, they're already under high risk where we are in that nice gray band. They're going to go to a very high risk even if we hit our target. Coastal flooding, is good. there's going to be a high risk of it. There already is. Uh, fluvial flooding, which is rivers and lake flooding. We've already got a moderate risk of it. It's, there's still going to be quite a moderate risk. And, you know, depressing stuff like ecosystems going away. That sort of fun stuff. So if you want to really depress yourself, I'd read that report. <laughs> there's another report I took out of the slides, which is what a four degree planet looks like. And uh, I just didn't want to talk about it because it says things like billions die. Um, so we should probably try and afford, avoid that. So this is obviously going to be front page news every day in every newspaper. What we actually get is uh, this sort of image. Uh, it's the hottest summer on record again. Let's all go to the seaside. Even when the headline is a bad one, they somehow pick an image. Um, like I wouldn't pick that for something that had death spike in the, in the headline. So people don't take it, seem like they don't take it seriously, but in 2018 that, that report was published and that really seems like an inflection point where people did start to take it seriously. Got, got quite real for a lot of people. Um, <coughs> Extinction Rebellion was founded in 2018. And you can sort of disagree with the tactics Extinction Rebellion use, but you can kind of understand their mindset of looking at that graph, we need to start dropping emissions and it doesn't seem like our current systems, our current political systems or, or uh, economic systems are going to drive that. We need to have some sort of drastic change. So individuals need to take action. And I think it's 2018, Greta Thunberg started her school strike for climate, which has been in the papers a lot recently and involved in March. So what it's paralyzing reading that kind of thing. And it's very easy to think, well, someone ought to do something about that. Um, 
So who, someone else should do something about that. So what kind of people are in a good position to do something about it? If you think about the global population of seven billion people, who are the people who can influence it? Well, maybe people who live in the UK. We're the sixth biggest economy in the world, for now. It might change. Um, and we're doing okay. We're not doing as well as we could be, but we're actually doing okay. Um, our emissions dropped by 29% in the last decade. Nearly a third. That's quite a dramatic change. Uh, just in 2019, it was 3% drop. And if you're an optimist and think this is something that steamrollers and actually increases over time, then that 3% drop could, the decarbonisation of our economy could pick up steam and be like a hockey stick and we get to net zero really fast if we put time and effort into it. Um, the government has set a net zero climate goal by 2050. And I think we're a country that has, we're a democratic country, we're not that big compared to GDP. So individual actions can have more of a magnifying effect. And our economy is based around um, well, financial services, but also innovation and high tech. So people who live in London and are in that kind of area maybe can help lead the world on how we decarbonise. And maybe people who work with PHP are really well set to help out. Um, the IT sector consumes 7% of global electricity. It's not all used in massive factories. We're using a lot. And if you graph it, it's going up massively. It's not decreasing. We're taking a bigger and bigger chunk of that. Allegedly, PHP powers 80% of the web. Has, have you heard that before? <laughs> PHP powers 80% of web servers that the survey could tell what technology was powering the web server. But I think PHP does power a massive chunk of the web. Uh, and developers make, on average, apparently, according to some stats, like twice the median UK income. So if you think that rich people are the ones who should be sorting it, maybe that's us. Obviously, personal circumstances vary. But a lot of people in development are doing okay. And maybe should be giving more and making more effort than people who are working paycheck to paycheck. So if you intersect working and live, lives in the UK in this nice, uh, innovation rich economy and works with the most common web programming language that's us if not us then who if you rank everyone in the world in order of being able to influence climate change we're in the top fractions of a percent so we should start doing stuff otherwise what are you going to tell your children or your nieces because a lot of the scary impacts aren't over 100 years and we'll all be dead by then they're around the time I'm retiring and want someone to look after me, that's when it gets serious. And I want to be able to say, well, I was trying. Please pay for a nice home for me. <laughs> so a few things we can do personally. We're going to get onto the stuff in your professional life, but really we need to reduce energy use and we need to re reduce emissions. Um, we'll talk a bit about offset offsetting, but Primarily, we need to reduce it energy usage, full stop. Um, we need to make the energy we are using renewable energy. Even if you're on a renewable tariff, you still need to reduce what you're using, because then there'll be more renewable for everyone else. And uh, it's good to offset the rest. I'm going to run through some simple things. Um, eat less meat. Agriculture and forestry. Forestry nowadays, a lot of it is clearing land to grow animals. It's about 25% of greenhouse gases, so you can either eat a lot less, or you can eat different stuff if you want to reduce. Um, beef can be hundreds of, well, not hundreds, orders of magnitude more expensive per gram than things like tofu and nuts, even eggs. And even if you look at you know, chicken versus beef, there's a huge disparity. If you think about what it takes to grow a cow, you have to grow loads of vegetables and then feed them to the cow, and you get a little bit of cow in exchange. Also, you have to clear land to grow the cow. 
you have to, the cow emits a lot of methane during its lifetime, which is worse than CO2 for the greenhouse gases. Um, so you don't have to go vegan, but maybe eat less red meat, maybe stop eating meat as often, that kind of change. Do go vegan if you feel like it. It's one of the biggest, it's the biggest impact most people can have. Um, shift your energy supply. Um, in the UK, personal carbon emissions for, 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 on average of 43% of it are electricity and gas. Because we're a slightly colder country than average, we spend a lot on heating. So if you're um, using uh, electricity and you're not on a renewable tariff, this is roughly the mix of what you're spending. So half of it will be coming from fossil fuels. So half the energy you use will be going into the atmosphere. About a third comes from renewables, which is very good uh, compared to some other countries on similar latitude. Yeah, that's latitude, isn't it? And about a sixth of it comes from nuclear. But we're not really building any more nuclear. If you look at France, they're building loads of nuclear. We're sort of going in on renewables and um, you can look at some parts of the UK, Orkney, is exporting energy massively because they've got huge amounts of wind and uh, solar. Not solar, wind and uh, wave <laughs> and very small amounts of solar. <laughs> um, if you're renting a house and it's, most, it's an electricity, and like a lot of new builds, there's no gas supply, it's just electricity, you can set your emissions to zero. You can set 43% of your emissions to zero by changing your energy supplier, which is a case of filling in a form. There's not, they're not really that more expensive, so unless you're really hard up, there isn't a lot of excuse. Um, moving from gas to electricity is harder. My house has got gas central heating. Um, we may be renovating our kitchen soon, and I'll switch the gas hob to an electric hob. But moving towards electricity is a good start, and you can get gas tariffs that are offset. And even within renewable tariffs, there's a big difference. Which did a report this year Two providers in the UK, I'm with this one, coincidentally. I was really pleased. I've been with them for 10 years. Um, two suppliers actually generate more electricity or directly buy energy from generators, so subcontract generation, um, than they provide to their customers. These providers all, not, they don't generate any electricity. They buy certificates from people who do, and then they buy all their electricity on the wholesale market. And these ones have a mix, so that report is worth reading. I will share the slides after for any of these references. And switching to one that's even more green within that 100% renewable can have a big impact. Because it's nearly half of our emissions in the UK, the, the, cutting down meat and switching your electricity provider, both of which are quite easy, will have a huge impact on your, your uh, emissions. This isn't so relevant to Londoners, but drive less. Um, if you do need to get a car, maybe get an electric car, but only when it's time to upgrade, only when it's time to get a new car. Electric, this is a Volkswagen uh, slide. Um, diesel full-time. This is the diesel, uh, and this is the manufacturing cost in carbon. And this is the manufacturing cost of the electric version. Um, and then the diesel obviously like, emits loads of stuff during its lifetime. This is the first 200,000 kilometers. And then depending where you're buying electricity, the EV will have different impacts. This is like zero impact if you only ever charge it on a renewable electricity. And this is if you just plug it into a standard UK, uh, EU energy mix. Um, there are things in London like Zipcar. Zipcar Flex is a nice scheme that I use sometimes. There's another called Blue City. You, you join, you make a membership, you look in the app, find a car nearby, use it for a one-way journey, park it somewhere random, ditch it. Costs about half what Uber costs, and a lot of their fleet is uh, electric, and they're increasing the percentage of electric cars. Um, and fly less. Uh, tech people fly around a lot to conferences and have little jollies to Amsterdam, like Jacob and I did recently. But it's really bad. I'm trying to stop. We need to reduce it. 
Um, maybe instead of two little holidays, have one big holiday, because then it'll be half the flights, that kind of thing. Maybe go to nice places in the UK by train. 34% um, of most people's emissions are air travel. It's probably more for affluent software developers who live in London. And then once you've reduced all that, you can start offsetting. Offsetting is quite interesting. There's lots of places that do offsetting. Um, you just, and it's surprisingly cheap. Last time I looked at pricing, because we sort of fire and forget, it's like less than a gym membership to offset your domestic um, carbon output. And that funds things like planting trees and increasing biomass. And it's not as good as reducing your usage, because you're sort of burning some coal and then planting some trees that you hope will soak up the coal. But it's better than nothing. Uh, I found out about this app recently, North. Um, it's like a lifestyle tracker if you're into that sort of thing. So if you ever use MyFitnessPal or any of those things, it's basically going to tell you every day what your carbon usage was, and then you can choose to offset that amount. The thing that I think is interesting for developers is um, all of the integrations are open source, so you can plug it into other systems. So at the moment, you can plug it into the Volkswagen app. You can plug it into TripIt to get all your airline stuff. You can plug it into your uh, TFL travel card to find out how many tube journeys you've made. And all of this gets aggregated into one view, so you can see where, you, where you're using a lot of carbon and where you can maybe reduce. Um, and they want people to write more integrations, and they're all open source. So if there's a, an area of your life where you spend energy, you can write an app for that and hit the API and bring it into North. So that's quite a nice uh, thing. You can also give to offsetting charities. If you give to charity, maybe consider climate charities. Um, this is, um, I haven't put it here, Offset Earth. And this is Phil Sturgeon. He used to do loads of PHP. He does lots of API stuff now. He's currently cycling around Europe and trying to live as low an energy lifestyle as he can, and it's quite entertaining if you look on his blog and his Instagram, and he keeps nearly dying when he gets stuck up a mountain on just his bicycle and he's freezing to death. And then some French guy stops in a van and offers him a room for the night. It's really entertaining. And then you can throw some um, credits at him. So Phil's currently planted 83,000 trees and offset 267 tons of carbon by being entertaining and asking people to sponsor him, which seems, seems worthwhile. That's all personal stuff. Let's look at how um, a software development company can affect things. The main thing you can do in your organization is help the organization start to care, start to care about their emissions. Most organizations won't measure that stuff if they can get away with it. But most of the time, you can measure carbon emissions in quite a fuzzy, guesstimatey way. Uh, because that's how everyone does it. It's all, it's all a bit of a black art. There's this nice blog post from um, Whole Grain Digital. This was a management initiative. They decided to start measuring their carbon emissions just in four main areas. Uh, the blog is interesting to read how they did it because they do have to obviously make assumptions, make estimates, try and ballpark things. And they produced this kind of dashboard of where, what their emissions looked like. And they started graphing it over years. And then just by the act of surfacing it and reflecting it back and saying, this is where we're at, they found they started to reduce it by saying, maybe we don't need to spend so much on travel. Or maybe the colors don't correspond. <laughs> maybe we can cut down this area. Actually, it's surprising that that amount ha happened um, on one of the climate slacks. There's an interesting conversation where the guy said, we realized that taking the video off the home page would have more of an effect than canceling the staff travel. <laughs> so we'll talk a bit more about the costs of tech. But actually starting to measure this stuff can be interesting. And you might not need permission, because n not a lot of this stuff requires privileged access to special accounts. You can just ballpark a lot of it and start, to start a conversation about it inside the company. Um, Something else to look at is your supply chain. Um, 
This is a Wardley map, which I'm not going to go into, but um, a guy called Paul Johnson um, has talked about using this kind of map to map carbon uh, emissions. This is an example where they're mapping out making a cup of tea, what's the emissions associated with buying the tea, what, what, what about the hot water, is the kettle more efficient, I mean, it helps you identify, you know, if you had a better kettle, our carbon footprint would go down. Having that kind of conversation, looking at who you're buying from, so it's not just about your emissions, who are you buying stuff from, and do they have a published um, emission rate? And the, the kind of ultimate aim is to get people in management to understand that you've got a kind of red line around what you're willing to do at work. This is something from Chris Adams. And it's not a manifesto, it's more a sort of message we want to get across. We're not going to work, use fossil powered infrastructure for new projects. I want you, my boss, to understand that. I'm not going to work on projects that are about extracting fossil fuels. Which takes a bit of courage to have that conversation. And it's a bit scary. I've worked in places where people have said, uh, I'm not going to work on Saturdays for religious reasons. Or they've said, I'm, I don't want to work on this gambling website. Two weeks ago, I turned down some work for a pornography company. <laughs> it's OK. It does happen in the industry that you can say, I don't want to work on that. And whenever I've seen it happen inside an organization, what tends to happen is the management go, oh, yeah, maybe we shouldn't be doing that project. But it's always had a good outcome the times I've seen it happen at work. OK, they don't want to work on it. Maybe we'll see if someone else can. Oh, it turns out no one wants to work on it. Maybe we're the bad guys. <laughs> and maybe we shouldn't be accepting that project. So obviously, you, you can't do this on your own easily. Um, you need to find allies inside an organization. So uh, starting a Slack channel to talk about this kind of issue, having a meeting at lunchtime. You can start to sort of self-organize. There's an image missing. <laughs> um, you'll hear things like businesses are here to make money, not save the planet. Uh, we're t our margins are too tight to even think about this stuff. There's a great guide at climateoutreach.org. The cover would be here. Um, it's got a sort of talking how to have that conversation. Um, and it em emphasizes not talking about these ideals of like in 100 years time we'll all be underwater, but talking about being more efficient, reducing waste, connecting it to real initiatives in other companies that had good outcomes. So there's some good resources there. Inside larger organizations, um, you need to be more organized. Who's in a organization with more than 1,000 people in? OK. A great example is Amazon. Um, Amazon have a Amazon Employees for Climate Justice group that was self-organized inside the company. And they wrote this open letter in April with over 8,000 Amazon employees signed it, saying, we don't agree with how the company is operating in certain areas. We think we should be reducing our carbon. And it had some quite specific aims in it. Um, they've also got a great Twitter presence. They're constantly reacting to things Amazon are doing in the public. And they're managing to do it in a way that isn't getting them all fired. <laughs> um, and actually, uh, Amazon recently pledged to reach net zero emissions by 2040. And uh, most commentators have said this employee action has been a strong driver. I, yeah, I'll talk more about Amazon later. Techie stuff, right. Why do we care? Why are we placed, apart from this generic, you know, help our companies, developers have a louder voice in companies than a lot of other employees in other sectors. So you can influence your organization. Developers have all the power because they can not write the code and then everything falls apart. Um, here's an interesting stat from this report, stat, state of data center energy use. All data centers require power, currently 2% of the world's electricity, that's in 2018. This puts data centers at the current energy consumption levels of the aviation industry. So if you're criticizing people who fly airplanes for a living, for working in a sort of sector that's killing the planet, 
we're on a similar sector. We're in a similar sector. That's a bit awkward. And the difference is that the energy use of the aviation industry is increasing slightly. The energy use of our industry is massively increasing over time. So in 2018, they're expecting it to exceed aviation by two to four times in the next four years. Well, in the next six years from when they wrote it. So yeah, maybe we're the bad guys. So what can we do? Um, something Derek mentioned in his talk last time. Um, <laughs> um, if you're on PHP 5, PHP 7 is about twice as fast. You can have half of as many servers. If we're talking about this in the context of the environment, you can emit half the amount of emissions, half the carbon can go in the atmosphere if you upgrade to PHP 7. According to a talk uh, Rasmus did, he included some stats. This is at PHP Benelux. He said if, if all those servers, about half of PHP servers are on PHP 5, which is insane. Um, if they're all converted to PHP 7, we'd re reduce global web server emissions by 7.5 million tonnes of CO2 a year, which is a lot. We also need to look at better process utilisation. How do we use those resources better? So there's lots of things we could be doing around profiling, around upgrades, PHP 7 preloading will get us another 1%, maybe. Um, but that's 1% less emissions going into the atmosphere, and we only need to drop it by 6% a year. So it sounds like a good thing to do, right? But we don't think about it in that context. We think about it as performance, and we, we put it on the back burner, and it's down in the backlog. If we're taking carbon emissions much more seriously, the development team would say, this is something we have to be doing. We need to be reducing the number of cycles it takes to serve this website. You do have to be aware of this paradox, Jevon's paradox. He noticed that when James Watt introduced his better steam engine, the coal usage in the UK went up. You would think that a better steam engine would mean that coal usage would go down. But what happened was more people got steam engines, so we have to be careful that while we're making our things more efficient, we're not also massively scaling them up. So counting our overall carbon output is still important, as well as carbon output per customer, or carbon output per pound we make. Outside of individual server efficiency, we need to look at how we, our whole infrastructure works. So this is a graph I did really professionally. Um, of how, like, you know, traffic to a website over the day, resource usage of the website over the day, how much we need. And back in the 90s, we used to buy a big web server and put it in a rack and it would be sitting there all day with the fans whirring and it would have enough capacity to serve all the traffic we needed. And we'd think that was a good situation because what we're trying to optimise is can we serve the amount of traffic we need to serve at peak time. Um, if you're thinking more about emissions, this red area is really bad because it means it represents unused capacity that we, we burn stuff and put it in the air without needing to. If you've got a sort of nice DevOps culture and you've taught yourself a load of Kubernetes and it doesn't crash all the time and no one brings down the whole grid constantly, so you've got good at it, you can have a nice auto-scaling approach where as soon as resources start to reach some threshold, more stuff gets provisioned nice in advance, and the actual capacity much better matches the uh, required capacity, which requires an investment. You have to sell that into management. You have to say, we could get by with fewer servers if we all go on this Kubernetes course and we break it a few times while we're learning what to do. And of course, the dream of serverless is that you outsource that knowledge to a cloud provider. So you say, I don't, I'm not going to learn how to auto scale things. I'm just going to use this cloud service that auto scales for me. And it becomes uh, Amazon or Google or Microsoft's problem to solve. But they've got loads of people and they're solving it across loads of sites. So maybe it's going to be a it's going to be a great economy of scale there. So how do you convince your boss? Well, there's a great selling point is that it's better for the environment, but also it's going to cost less. 
If we don't have all this reserved capacity, you see this more and more in cloud pricing as well, especially serverless pricing. The cloud providers want you to pay just for what you use because they want to snatch that capacity off you to give to the other customers. So generally, when you're looking at some sort of project to auto-scale your clusters or a project to move to serverless, there's also some big dollar amount or pound amount that you can attach to the project and say, this is going to save us this much a year. We should do it. And then you can secretly be thinking, ha, 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 we'll also save the planet. Um, so where do you put this stuff? Who's hosting in the cloud? Who's hosting on AWS? Who knows if the AWS services are powered by renewable energy? Nobody. So AWS has five special regions that are 100% renewable. And the rest are not. Um, the ones in Europe are Ireland and Frankfurt. So if your services are coincident, this is just on a page on the Amazon site, it's not a secret. Um, if your services are there, you, they're 100% renewable, which includes offsetting. If they're anywhere else, they're 50% or less renewable energy. So I don't know in your organization how important the region is or how much management even know what region things are running in, but maybe you can just move it all to the renewable energy ones without anyone noticing. They're a bit pricey though. Hmm? They are a bit pricey. Well. I'm not saying it's a problem. Amazon make it so hard to find out what you're paying for, <laughs> but it's fine. And at Map Camp this year, Adrian Cockcroft, who works for AWS, was talking a bit about this, and he said, Amazon have this sort of philosophy that everything they do is driven by the customers. So he said, if you want to see more renewable energy use at Amazon, you should push your services into these data centers, into these regions, sorry. I mean, that's another way of saying Amazon have no morality of their own, <laughs> and they're just following what, 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 what you want to do. But um, the reason I'm singling out Amazon is they're 32% of cloud provision. Azure is in second place on 18%. So Amazon are the big game in town, and they're actually one of the worst for renewability. So another thing to consider, the report I mentioned earlier, had the quote from, this is the link to it, it's worth reading, rates the different cloud providers by how uh, renewable they are. Um, Amazon gets a C- minus because they only have this limited set of regions. I don't know why that says four. I was trying to find out this morning. But they only have renewable energy in a few regions. The others are 30 to 50%. They've got some commi recent commitments I mentioned to get to net zero, but it's unclear how that's going to happen. Um, so that's why they get a sort of C- minus rating on their renewability. In contrast, Google are at 100% renewable everywhere. Um, and Azure is 100%, that includes offsets, but they very recently, maybe a month ago, made a commit, Microsoft as a whole have made a commitment to um, get carbon negative by 2030. And they want to get carbon negative across their entire supply chain by 2050. That means everyone they buy from, they're going to include that in the accounting and they're still going to be carbon negative. Um, so if you're going to launch something tomorrow, Azure is probably the, mo the greenest option. Failing that G Google Cloud, failing that AWS in one of their renewable regions. You have to balance that against the knowledge you have of what services are available and team understanding. If you're not hosting in the cloud, this is a good resource, the Green Web Foundation. They basically ask um, hosting providers to prove that they're green. Um, so there's a directory of which hosting providers are powered by renewables. You can also then type in a random domain and uh, it'll tell you whether it's green hosting or not. I'll let you try that yourself. Um, and they'll say, it's either like this is green, this is not green, or we don't know. It's kind of based on IP ranges and stuff like that. So the last thing I'm going to talk about, and maybe the unexpected thing is bandwidth costs, because it's not something we think about when we're thinking about energy usage. Um, so this is the stat I found surprising. 
to serve a website, 30% of the emissions come from the data center. 42% comes from the browser, often a mobile phone nowadays. 28% comes from all that stuff that's in between the data center and the browser. So a third of the emissions are coming from, you can control the energy mix of your data center. You can't really control the energy mix of your users. And you can't really control the energy mix of all of those hops. This is the Virgin Meter cabinet at the end of my road that's always open. You can't really control their energy usage. Although this one, you, there is a power switch in here that you could just <laughs> switch the street off if you wanted to. And I keep tweeting them about it. You'd have the emissions from the van that comes to the Yeah, the van, diesel van comes along. So looking at this, right, if we halved the page size of all of our pages, we'd reduce 14% of our emissions. But people don't really op optimize for page size. Um, some people do. But it's, it's often a low priority thing down the stack because you sort of say, well, if the page takes two seconds to load, no one cares. You know, users are happy enough. But if we're thinking about the emissions, it's having a massive effect on the emissions. We can optimize our data center by writing smart code, hosting it somewhere green. We can optimize the network by, we can optimize the user devices by having less computationally intensive stuff and not serving super compressed images that then have to get massively uncompressed. Just don't serve the image at all. Um, we can control how much data we're pushing down the pipe to customers. One of my recent projects was a site speed optimization. It wasn't for green reasons, but it was for you know, other reasons. Another surprising one. Mobile's even worse. 3G takes 15 times more energy than wired. 4G takes 23 more times more energy than Wi-Fi, which is ridiculous. Is 5G going to be more energy efficient? I doubt it. It makes sense because to talk to a mobile, f to talk to my router in my house, a, a signal goes along a, a fiber, then to the cabinet, then to a cable that goes to my house. Whereas to get to my phone, like, I have this thing on the roof that spams it out in every direction in high powered radio and tries to work out where your phone is. The sort of counterintuitive thing is that we. As mobile bandwidth gets better, we're trying to use it. We're making the most of it. We're saying, oh, and 5G's here. Now we can finally serve HD video to, to mobile handsets. But we should not be, because it's incredibly energy inefficient. So as mobile gets faster and faster, we still need to aggressively cache stuff with technologies like service workers. We still should have an offline first approach. I can open the app and it doesn't connect to the network until I need to do something that requests some data or do a refresh. Don't serve really large assets. That was what I was talking about before. A company realized that the video on their homepage had similar emissions to their staff flights budget and they could replace it with a still image and take a huge chunk out of their emissions. And uh, something you can do with apps I don't think you can do with websites yet is detect whether they're on a mobile connection and reduce the amount of data. I'm not sure there's an API for that in the web. Um, obviously, site speed is something that's really important to focus on anyway. Having small, fast to download pages increases engagement. Google are now rewarding it for SEO, faster, first contentful paint and all that kind of thing. Um, I'm working on a project with an e-commerce customer who are really trying to optimize their page load speed and reduce the size of all their images so that Google rank them higher, among other things. And uh, recently launched, there's this tool SiteSpeed.io, which is a kind of um, performance, front-end performance tooling. There's now a sustainability plugin. So if you install that, it will tell you the amount of grams of carbon released per page request. So you can include that in your CI, maybe. Include it in your stats. Obviously, to sell it to, tell it, sell it to management, you're saying, it's great for accessibility. We shouldn't have the video. We should have some text because, because accessibility. We'll get sued. And it's great for SEO. And Google have a load of you know, uh, convincers about 
if you halve the page load time, your checkout conversion rate goes up by 20%, all that kind of nice stuff. So what to do next? Uh, I recommend joining Climate Action Tech. Uh, it's a sort of group. Um, there's a mailing list that has a, I can't remember if it's a weekly or monthly email. It has loads of links to blogs, news and resources around these areas. It also has jobs listed, so they, they highlight contracts that are in these areas if you want to get involved. They also highlight open source work that's helping with the climate. There's also a very active Slack channel associated with it, so you get a lot more information about this stuff. Um, most of what I've talked about I've learned from going to their events. There's a meetup and also the mailing list. Um, do try and identify where your stack overuses energy and fix it. I phrase that quite technically because I think it's something technical people should be doing. And it's not something you need to ask permission for. Um, if a mechanic notices the car's running really badly, they could fix it without saying, hey, do you want your car to run more efficiently? Uh, and do you start doing that awkward soft skills thing of finding other people who think who care about this as well inside your organization and then just talking to them about it. It has a surprising snowball effect. It also has a really good mental health effect in that if you're worried about climate change, doing positive things towards it really helps. Uh, so that's been me. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? It's not allowed yeah. to be, it is climate change. Thank really. you so much. I really enjoyed that. And oh, I got more and more questions, and it's <laughs> quite interesting. But the main thing is actually looking into virtualization at one point, how far this saves or while we virtualize unnecessary on a machine. Mm -hmm. But also, if we integrate frameworks, the inference I would be interested to hear about, then was we use languages they many times translate until they reach the CPU core. Oh, yeah. Well, if you think about that, even when we write our code in hex, it gets still twice translated into macro into micro code. Mm. And what is energy? Is power consumption? Is heat? So now, now we say JavaScript and all, all these things. And and the last part I'm, I would be interested in, <laughs> in that is down. the influence of analytics what mostly most business websites run. yeah. So they blow them up to seven megabyte. I've seen that really, and there's not much on the page, so. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's go in reverse order, because you can remember the last things. Yeah, analytics is a big one. The site speed project I mentioned um, has a Facebook tracking pixel, and taking it off the page, half the page load time. And we're yet to find a way of adding it back in without massively sacrificing the page load time. Because it's already loading asynchronously, but it just takes a really long time to load. So that company is having to make a decision between a fast, efficient page load, which, is good, which you can see is, um, there's not a load of bandwidth involved, but there's a lot of browser CPU involved, and a customer annoyance, because the page isn't interactive yet until the thing's loaded. They're going to have to make the call about whether they want to do the creepy Facebook tracking advertising or not. And when you look in a typical Google Tag Manager thing, it's adding loads of stuff to the page. This is something that's always picked up. As soon as anyone starts doing a, a page speed audit, but we don't generally take page speed that seriously currently as an industry because we just see it as a thing that's going to sort of in, improve UX rather than seeing it as a thing that's actually going to save a lot of energy and emissions. Something I didn't get a chance to talk about was having internal budgeting. Microsoft had talked about they've got an internal carbon tax, so they do try and work out how much carbon they're releasing for every activity, and then they put that money into a, a charitable thing, so like adding a bit of pain that's associated with your emissions can really help. What were the other things we asked about? <laughs> um, virtualization. Uh, something I skipped from the presentation was uh, in the old days, we used to have separate servers for things just because it was neater and they had different file systems, different Linuxes. And nowadays with Docker, rather than virtualization, you can collapse all those things onto one box. So we used to have like a separate web server box and a separate email box 
and a separate database box just to make the sysadmin easier. Now they can be one hardware device because they don't actually need the extra CPU and you can kind of pretend they're separate. Uh, I think that's, that's a positive trend. What were the other things? It was, it was well, the virtualization as you create the hardware. Oh, the distance from the CPU. So, so this costs quite a lot of energy. Yeah. You run, uh, you run many of those on one machine. That's what I mean. How much waste would be in there? Yeah, ideally we'd all be writing um, assembly. Yeah, and I think a positive thing is the rise of Rust and Go uh, in, in, in web development because they're both more efficient but have other problems. But Go itself can make a really efficient container. Um, it's not the question, it's more like uh, something in plus to your talk. Okay. Um, you mainly talk about the energy use of our websites and stuff like that, but uh, I think sometimes we should think about even our water use or, or like the amount of plastic that we use because a lot of that uh, goes into ocean. Uh, I just underline the fact of water use. For example, the United Emirates, they, uh, they use more uh, <clears throat> petrol to produce water. Hmm. That's why the water is very expensive there. So it's not just about the things that we can do in electricity, I think. It's more about the small things that we can do in, even in the other parts. Yeah, I think um, uh, it, it, that's very important. And um, it, it's maybe less for this audience, but having people inside a company who can advocate um, looking at where we're, what we're using in our office, I mentioned it briefly on the, the this thing. Um, where are we getting our tea from? Where does the kettle come from? Having that kind of awareness inside a company and having a sort of commitment to account for it is really important. And that, bring, that suddenly surprises you with these things like, hang on, why is the water so big? And you realize you're buying it from the one supplier who runs a petrol generator to purify things. Awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. I think we'll have a couple more questions. So yeah, it's it's more about okay. We say carbon footprint. This is dirt, but with all the batteries we create, yeah, uh, lithium. Don't we put probably the dirt from the carbon into lithium? So well, we get batteries everywhere in our cars and. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> What's um, your view on that? Car batteries are really expensive to make. Um, and they, the metals inside them come from dodgy places where people are being exploited to mine these heavy metals. So if you look at the supply chain for a, for a lithium ion battery, uh, you'll almost inevitably find some human rights abuses. So you've got to balance that against carbon output, of course, and that's one of the reasons the cost is quite high. What we haven't seen yet with electric cars is um, the fact that a lithium-ion battery can be completely stripped down and almost completely refurbished without needing extra materials. There's batteries everywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and batteries everywhere is um, going to play a big part in <sighs> helping this energy mix. So at the moment, one of the reasons we burn a lot of gas is a gas turbine can be switched on and off, almost, not, not on demand, it takes ages to start them and stop them, but um, you can control when it's producing. Um, you can't control when all the renewables are producing, so um, there's some investment ha just been announced in a 10 terawatt hour battery storage facility in Oxfordshire. I think we'll see more of that over time. Interesting thing there is they can use um, depleted electric car batteries that maybe are only running at 80% efficiency and you can use them as part of a battery energy storage system uh, near a town to iron out the fluctuations of renewables and provide a constant power supply. So I think that's a very interesting area in the future. This, there are some battery technologies on the horizon but it's never good to speculate about stuff that doesn't exist yet. Yeah, just on that battery thing, I think Tesla were looking at something in Australia. 
Tesla put in a big battery plant in Australia yes, to massive, help yeah. their yeah. droughts. Yes. Um, and a lot of that was ex-Tesla yes. batteries. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we've got one last question. Uh, we'll do the raffle and uh, cool. I'm sure Kieran will be at the pub. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> no, I've got two sort of questions, I suppose, or interlinked questions. One positive, one slightly negative. Sure. How do you feel about the, do you think fusion is likely to help us in any way in the near future? But no. on the other side, um, the question is, um, the UK produces about 1% of carbon emissions, um, which is a tiny fraction compared to places like China. Um, mm. how, do, how do you feel those two issues relate to this topic you've talked about tonight? Um, fusion power is really promising, but it's been 20 to 30 years away since the 1950s. There's no prospect of getting working fusion power before uh, climate change hits us. So it's not, it's not a short-term strategy we can take. We can hope that if we get to one and a half, if we manage to achieve one and a half degrees um, temperature increase, and most of us live through it, we might then get fusion power. It's not gonna save us in the short term. Similarly, building new nuclear plants, the lead time is so much, it's not, it's not really going to get us through what we're facing in the next 20 years. The thing about um, the um, net contribution of Britain to emissions is that there's loads of people in China. It's more than a billion. If you look at the emissions per capita, the US is obviously winning and then next is Europe. If you look at historical emissions and, you know, colonialism, we're way ahead. We're way ahead of everyone else by orders of magnitude. So we need to do something about it. And we've got a moral responsibility there. We can't um, spend a century churning out coal and then say, well, it's China's problem. That's what I think. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>